Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Shafika Adha, and I'm actually a composer and musician from Singapore. Um, I'm very happy to be here to share with you this presentation, Sha'ib Vidasari Reimagined, which is actually um, a sharing session of uh, interdisciplinary music and theatrical dance project that was presented, uh, premiered in Singapore in 2016. And this particular festival is actually an international music festival. So we got the opportunity to present this work to a more international audience. So I will go in first uh, uh, to tell you about what is Sha'i Bidasari. Sha'i Bidasari is translated as the poem of Bidasari. Uh, Sha'i is a strict Malay poetic form consisting of four line stanzas. Uh, or quatrains, and the rhyme is A A A A at the at the end of each line. Uh, it is written the the Sha'i Bidasari is a pan Malay folklore. It's a romantic folklore which is which was written in a thousand and thirty five stanzas, one o three five stanzas. So you can imagine how long the story is, and it's believed to be composed as early as seventeen fifty. The story of Sha'i Bidasari was made more popular in 1965 when it was adapted into a white, black and white film uh, by Singaporean and Malaysian actors, actor, actresses and uh, pro production. And this was screened during the golden age of Malay films in the region. So what's the story of Sha'i Bidasari? I'm going to tell the story through the images I've taken from the film. So once upon a time, that if the girl named Bidasari, whose soul was magically bonded to a fish. <laughs> so because of this, whenever there is, uh, the fish is out of water, Bidasari collapses. Okay, so the fish is out of water, Bidasari collapses and uh, she becomes lifeless. But when the fish is back into the water, Bidasari came back to life. So as a baby, Bidasari was abandoned in the forest and she was found and adapted. Uh, adopted by a merchant. She grew up to be the most beautiful young woman in the land, but someone was very jealous of her beauty, and that person was none other than the queen of the land. And the queen, she secretly practiced uh, black magic, and she got to know about Vidasari's identity through a magic mirror. Mm, sounds familiar? <laughs> So, uh, anyways, <laughs> anyways, the story gets a little bit more complicated from here, but uh, to cut it short, the queen uh, tortured Vidasari and found out about her fish. She captured the fish and she hung it around her neck. So, Vidasari became lifeless. And along came a prince who somehow mystically dreamt about Vidasari and fell in love with Vidasari. And... Uh, he rescued Bidasari's fish from the queen, uh, revived Bidasari, and they both lived happily ever after. <laughs> yeah. So that's the abridged story of Bidasari. The production. So in June 2016, I was approached by the, the organizers of Singapore International Festival of Music, CFORM, and I was made the composer in residence of the festival. The festival organizers had commissioned me to create a new work in collaboration with a performing arts company called Bumi Collective. Now, Bumi Collective uh, is founded by two Singaporeans who are now two good friends of mine. Uh, Noor Amin Farid, I call him Amin. He is a dance practitioner as well as a dance choreographer. And Shaiful Bahri is the producer and theatre practitioner. I call Shaiful Shai. Uh, therefore, the niche of this company is mostly in theatrical dance production. So, this would be the first time that the company would produce a major production that would involve live music. It was the start of a wonderful artistic collaboration between me and Amin, prim primarily between the both of us because Amin became the creative director of the work and I was the music director of the production. And this production, later on, we call it Ikan Girl. Why Sha'i Bidasari? 
Well, the theme of the music festival was myths and legends. So Booby Collective and I thought that it was a great opportunity to stage a work that would put the Singaporean Malay community in the limelight of a and within the context of a classical music festival. Shai, Amin and I took pride in presenting a work that would feature several aspects of our Malay cultural heritage to an international audience. It was important for us to choose a suitable Malay folklore to be retold at sea form. So Shai Bidasari was finally chosen because it's not a popular folk tale that is often told in Singapore. And we thought that it had an interesting content that we could work with. The story of Bidasari, as you all already heard, also bore a strong resemblance to the famous Snow White. So we thought that the audience would appreciate this generic familiarity of Shai Bidasari's storyline. However, it was nearly impossible for Shai Bidasari to be retold <coughs> in its original entirety. And this is because we had to tell the story only through music and dance movements alone, without the use of uh, dialogues. So the performance making of this folklore for sea form had forced an alteration of the story of Bidasari, making it an, a reimagination and therefore leading to the creation of a new myth that we call Ikan Girl. Yes, Ikan Girl uh, is a combination of two words. Uh, Belay, Belay word and also English, Ikan means fish, so the meaning of Ikan girl is fish girl. So yeah, you can see why we call it that way, because it has something to do with Bidasari and her magical bond with a fish. Ikan girl was premiered in two days, on 21st and 23rd of October 2016. It was staged in the Arts House Singapore uh, in a venue called The Chamber. This used to be a, a parliamentary house, old parliament house where members of the parliament, Singapore members of parliament get together to uh, do their meetings. So uh, it was. it's now turned into an arts venue. So the production, this is an entire production crew, cast members, musicians, uh, it involved eight cast members or dancers, of which Amin was one of the main cast, uh, five musicians and a conductor. I was part of the mu musician because I played the accordion and uh, I wrote for the accordion for this performance. And the production team behind the scenes comprising of Shai, the producer himself, and a lighting designer. Shai Bidasari has a complicated uh, storyline with numerous characters. So we had to reimagine the story in coherent visual and oral narrative without the use of spoken words um, so that we can create a succinct uh, storyline. On top of this, we were only given 15 minutes to run the performance and we only had eight mem member cast. So it was with these circumstances that the story of Ikan Girl came about. Through my discussions with Amin, with the way we created this Ikan Girl myth, the new myth, is that we first pick out the most important characters to keep in Ikan Girl. At first, the four significant main characters were Bidasari herself, the embodiment of Bidasari's soul, that is the fish, uh, the, the antagonist, the jealous queen, and lastly, Bidasari's saviour and love interest, which is the prince. So through these four characters, we took out important plot lines and details that would tell the essence of Sha'i Bidasari. But we still found, we still found that uh, these important, these plot lines were still tediously intricate to be portrayed just by music <coughs> and dance alone. So they had to be further condensed. There were two significant changes that we made in Ikan Girl. The first one was a creation of a new secondary character that was the Queen's Lackey, uh, or a minion, okay? So the Queen's minion who does her dirty work for her, such as uh, kidnapping Bidasari and the fish. So this, uh, the second change was a complete removal of the prince. This was because his existence, were, uh, the role he played in Shai Bidasari complicated the storyline too much so, but nevertheless, Amin and I still wanted to retain the 
uh, aspect of romantic love from Shaikh Vidasari because that is essentially the core nature of the poem, the epic poem. It's a romantic story. So we thought, what if instead of the prince, we make the queen's lackey fall in love with Vidasari? So bingo, this actually saved us uh, in the economy of characters. Uh, but more than that, having the lackey to replace the <coughs> prince, we were able to avoid the cliché happily ever after ending. We chose to end Ikan Girl instead with a twist, uh, making it into a romantic story of sacrificed love, which you will hear later on. So at a glance, this is a new myth that we created. Vidasari grew up in a forest since she was a baby with animals as her guardians. She became the most beautiful young woman of the land and this became the jealousy of the queen. She, the queen then instructed her lackey to bring Vidasari to her and in the process, the lackey and Vidasari fell in love with each other. The queen tortured Vidasari and because it was too much for Vidasari to bear, she revealed that her soul was connected to a fish. Once again, the lackey was instructed to capture the fish, but he didn't know that his actions had, had caused Vidasari to become lifeless. When he returned and found Vidasari lifeless, he was enraged at the queen and a battle ensued be between the both of them. The lackey, of course, won the battle and he returned Vidasari to the forest. After the lackey re released the fish into the lake, Vida Vidasari then awoke. As she reached out for her saviour, she sensed the spark that they had shared before. However, the lackey was ashamed of his wrongdoings towards Vidasari and he deemed himself unworthy of her love. So he chose, he chose to surrender his affection of her and walked away. So that's the whole uh, entire story of Ikan Girl. Now, I'll, I'll talk about the process of collaboration that happened between Amin and I and how it, uh, the whole production evolved. So the process of collaboration was a big thing for Amin and I because how do you bring together two different forms, art forms to tell a, a story without one having no precedence over the other? You have music and also we have theatrical dance. Uh, both Amin and I were adept at telling stories through our own uh, art forms, so we had to be in confluence, to be in confluence in our direction of portraying the story of Ikan Girl. What happened was this process unfolded organically for us, for the both of us. There wasn't like a pre-planned way in which we worked together, but we found out later on that there were actually three strategies that occurred in our collaboration. The first strategy. We work working separately upon the same storyline. In July 2016, we started off our discussions online and came up with the storyline of Ikan Girl. I wasn't able to work with Amin physically because at that time, Bumi Collective was staging a play at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So, but since we have discussed online, with the guide of the storyline, uh, I started off with the draft of the music. And then Amin had some ideas himself about what he will do with the dance and the theatrical movements. The second strategy, music before the theatrical dance component and vice versa. It was only in late August that Amin and I met. I was already, I already had the draft of the first and the second acts of mm -hmm. Ikan Girl completed, so I let him listen to it. Mm -hmm. And this worked well with Amin, so so much so, he could use those drafts to devise the theatrical dance movements for the dancers. But subsequently, the process is reversed. Amin caught up with the choreography of other scenes before I could complete the music. I was able to come for the dancers' rehearsals and take video recordings of the choreography as it unfolded. But, and through these rehearsals, I had a deeper understanding of Amin's visions in his directions and this greatly helped me to reflect the same intended meaning in the music as I worked on it at home. The third strategy, active collaboration. This third strategy uh, saw both of us actively collaborating and cooperating during rehearsals. So both of our presence during rehearsals 
with the dancers determines what aspects of the music and theatrical dance movements could or could not work with each other. During rehearsals, we made decisions and changes to the work in situ to realize both our visions. So now I will touch on the music and theatrical dance of Ikai Girl. Ikai Girl's visual and theatrical component involve the inclusion of various dance gestures such as traditional Malay dance, Indian classical dance, Western contemporary dance and Western contemporary dance. Other than reflecting diversity, these various dance forms were crucial in their employment as they present many strengths that were fully, fully utilized to help express the story. So it's a very unique component of uh, Ikan Girl with all these different uh, kinds of dances coming together. Firstly, traditional Malay dance, uh, it has this inherent connection to nature and so it helped with the movement vocabulary of the ensemble who were playing uh, Vidasari's uh, Animal Guardians. You can see here um, the, the fluidity of the movements, hand movements and gestures. Uh, <coughs> some of these movements were actually taken from traditional Malay dance. Next one, Bharatanatyam, a classical Indian dance with its tradition of the mudras gestural movement, vocabulary, and Abhinaya's facial expression. So this provided an, an, an entry point for a character to show different emotions through theatrical dance. And um, this is the character of the queen. Okay, the very vigorous dance movement show the fierceness the, of the character of the queen. The use of contemporary dance with its less rigid and liberal expressive forms provided a contrast to the rigidity of Asian dance forms and assisted in creating alternative symbolisms through the contortion of the body and manipulation of the limbs. So um, all these movements over here um, have been taken from uh, contemporary dance and this is actually the lackey trying to catch the fish, the one in, in a purple um, uh, shirt. This is the video recording during our rehearsals, by the way. Music of Ikan Girl. This is the instrumentation that I've used for the music. Uh, flute, violin, accordion, piano, and all these percussions. <coughs> that is the layout plan for the <coughs> instruments. I use this strategy of coming up with musical themes for each character. With each theme, a main instrument is used to represent the character and I did this by attributing the timbre of the instrument to the nature of the <coughs> character. So for example, the flute represented Vidasari, piano and vibraphone the fish, violin the lackey, accordion the queen. As a classically trained composer, I have often sought to infuse aspects of my identity and cultural heritage into my works. Uh, I am myself an accordionist who practices traditional Malay music, so blending Malay musical elements into my contemporary writing was not new to me as I've often experimented on these concepts in some of my works. I will explain some of the strategies that I had employed in bring, bringing out these influences of traditional Malay music in the composition. Um, but before I do so, let me play for you a short clip of an Asli Malay uh, music ensemble, so if you have an idea of how Malay, traditional Malay music sounds like. <laughs> can see how um, there are, uh, prom the prom prominent feature is mostly the use of embellishments, okay, such as the crush notes, moderns, and trills, and then, how many, how much? Five? <laughs> okay, so um, just to let you hear, this is a common motif that is involved, uh, or that is usually heard in Malay repertoire. Da, 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 da. Okay, so this was one of the motifs that I included into my uh, my work. This Vidasari 
theme, um, the embellishments, and also the melodic motif. I will go on to say that um, it was very difficult to combine together the uh, contemporary music writing and traditional Malay harmony. Uh, it's a challenge because usually I felt that the essence of Malay music comes from using uh, the, the <coughs> traditional tonality, uh, which is mal uh, sorry major and minor modes. Um, so what I employed here is to um, to create um, uh, to create a modality which is very close to a major scale, and I raised the fourth note. And then you can see <coughs> the tension cut from the whole tone scale. Uh, it provided the tendencies of uh, contemporary writing or uh, contemporary harmonies. So without further ado, I'll, I'll let you hear the theme from Vidasari. embellishments that I included in and um, the, the use of the melodic motifs in this piece. Uh, <laughs> One more, okay, maybe I can show you that uh, the Queen's theme. The, yeah, the, um, the, there is no Indian influence of uh, music in the theme, um, but still, this is my way of writing contemporary music uh, based on a created scale and um, it's, it's eternal because of the use of tritones, the leaps of tritones and sevens and there is also a tone row that is manipulated in repeated leap and step fashion uh, and the exploitation of accordion timbres became something which is very prominent in the Queen's theme. So, <laughs> Watch as well the, as the as how the queen is presented. <laughs> just conclude by saying that um, moving forward the production team really felt that there could be improvements to the work that we've uh, done here it was an accomplishment for us because the whole thing happened within two months um, will, will the production be performed again maybe but uh, Amin and I had thought about remodeling the story to be <coughs> more applicable to today's society for example what could the implication of a shared life or soul with, soul with another creature mean in today's world? And even the notion of Bidasari, a girl playing damsel in distress, is an outdated notion in our world today. So how can we fix that? We hope to be looking at these things in the future revival of Ikan Girl. So these are some of the production uh, photos. Uh, we've received quite numerous positive feedback. Um, yeah, and it's a whole production crew. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So Any questions? Comments? So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just the last clip on the, the, the Queen's dream, is it? Uh, the last clip. The, uh, the, the Queen is. The uh, mm -hmm. 
it's her representation of how she uh, portray herself as in that is how the character is being told the story is being told so how, um, I think the dancer was doing some Bharatanatyam yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. so how, how, how do you connect the Bharatanatyam movements with the queen okay <laughs> so you, you saw you've seen how the queen's movements is very energetic and that for uh, that gives the uh, allurance or, or the outlook of um, fierceness. Okay, so he sh her stomping may signify that she's very angry, you know, and her very sharp movements, Bharatanatyam movements are very sharp. So that uh, that actually shows that she is very authoritative, and sh her actions reflect what she wants her lackey to do, for example, or what is it that um, that is going on in the story. Uh, and her facial movements as well, you know, because it's very much uh, a, a crucial component in Bharata Natyam, and that already shows her expression, what she um, intends to do within the story itself. Yeah. Um, my, my my question is just like uh, same like Claire, but uh, I I just want to ask you how 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 do you deal with the uh, movements of the actors or or each elements of the drama? But 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 your answer already clear. But uh, so so I have one more question: mm -hmm. like How many drafts you write until it's finished? fully finished perfectly. Okay, so mm -hmm. we started discussions in July, right? And then uh, Amin only, the whole production team only came back like uh, late August, early September. Um, and I have not completed the music yet. So the work is still concurrently being done. Mm -hmm. It only uh, finished like uh, maybe two weeks before, mm -hmm. one or two weeks before the actual performance that. itself. Mm -hmm. So the draft, it... Um, yeah. I don't remember actually how many. <laughs> there are lots of drafts, um, lots of, um, uh, how, what do you say, alterations to the music according to changes that he made. And then uh, I made changes to the music as well, and he had to make changes to the uh, choreography. So, yes, there, ha there has been lots and lots of drafts. And it was uh, only that two weeks before the actual performance that the scores were printed out then I could rehearse with the musicians. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The original story that they put on in the Arabic text yes. a lot. Yeah. How you relate them to you know, your modern interpretation? Okay. Um the the original story itself we frankly I should say that we took it at a surface level. Um, mm. In fact, Sha'i Vidasari uh, is a poetic form which is sung. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I could have um, taken inspirations from that, you know, musical um, inspirations or um, motifs that could have been done, could have been uh, incorporated into music. But I w at that point of time, I wasn't very familiar with that, that uh, component. So I worked with what I was familiar with. Um, and yeah, the uh, in terms of the literal literary work mm. itself, um, we've not really gone deep into how it can be connected to the um, the the work. What we've done is just extracting the story of Vida Sari because it's a, a folk tale that has been um, told to children. Um, so in this ca in this case, it's more of like a in it's inspired. Okay. Yeah, the work is inspired. That's why you name it Ikan Girl yeah. rather than the Vidasari. Uh, that's right. It so didn't mm. have the, the long sort of melismatic Shatner lines like you would hear in a you know, song Shatner. Well, um, that, that sense, in that sense, like, in, mm. like I mentioned to you before, my theme, it actually draws from, in, you know, traditional Malay music, but more towards the instrumental mm -hmm. side. Um, and even so, there are melismatic lines in instrumental music. So mm -hmm. that was what I actually tried to uh, incorporate into the music itself. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that you, you have a lot. There's a lot of resources to draw from in Malay music that mm -hmm. that um, 
are just being touched upon. I mean, not even very deeply these days, but something right, like Shatnir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the history of Shatnir, Shatnir, Shatnir is actually, it's, it's from Arabic, Shatnir. Okay. But it's been uh, appropriated in the Malay world. But the, the Shatnir was, was like the popular song of the early 1800s. It was something mm-hmm. that was spread throughout the region. And, and they used to tell stories and tell political polemics through, through these Shatnir. I mean, it's, it's, it has a very rich literary history. But now, all we have are the writings, the, the, the texts, mm-hmm. and the songs have, have been lost because they happen. Now maybe there's a few melodies, shot mm-hmm. melodies, but, but the, it's such a rich area to, <coughs> to explore. And, and that's just one. I mean, there's mm-hmm. sisters giving down, there's shot there's, sure. there's, 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 there's different, different forms style. of shot different forms of the <coughs> song. A- actually, there is a song that is um, the, the melody of shot which is entitled Sha'e Bidasari, mm-hmm. uh, Lagu Sha'e Bidasari. So mm-hmm. I'm not so sure whether that is um, related very well with the text of mm-hmm. Sha'e Bidasari or it's just a title to a given song. Yeah. yeah. But the melodic text that goes mm-hmm. so deep inside the tradi- I mean, when we talk about traditional music, and we talked about this, Claire and I were talking about this before, mm-hmm. about the, the history and the connection with. Um, Mm-hmm. For example, people always refer back to, to Portuguese music as sort of founding Joe Get and all of these things. But but there's a whole other local tradition that have been there for mm-hmm. a thousand years or more. That I mean, you hear these in, in the melodies of the Matlu or the Tumas de Nora or the Tena of yesterday. I mean, these, these types of melodies have a very deep history, and I think that they can provide really good resources for, for your local, like your, your tribe. We create this Malay identity with these yeah. politicians. I think that would be very useful. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank